Welcome everyone to the May 2023 Tree Chat. We are going to talk pomegranates with our good friend Tom Spellman. So um, this is the Tree Chat. This is an urban farm staple now. And as you notice, I'm not Greg Peterson. Greg is taking a very much needed vacation with his sweetie and going to hit the East Coast beaches for the first time. So we'll hear back from him later. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump over to my, um, my screen so we can get ready to start this. All right. I think I shared the right one. Did I share the right one? Looks what right. Looking to at? You. Okay. Night <laughs> tree chat. Let's talk pomegranates with Tom Spellman. All right. So first off, for everyone here tonight, thank you for joining us. Our tree chats are free. Thankfully, we're going to continue to do that, but we do appreciate your support. So if you'd like to send us a little love, you can go to urbanfarm.org slash support us. I'm starting off there just so I can get it out of the way because too many times, Greg, and I do this, and in the end, we're going, oh, we forgot to say that. So I'm saying it a little early. So uh, the way our tree chats work is that I'm going to be talking with Tom about the questions of the topic, of course, and you get to put your questions in the Q&A. Go ahead and plop them in there and we will address them when, they, when we can or at the very end. We'll make sure we get to as many as we can today. And if you don't get your questions answered or if you have more questions, you can always send an email to Greg at fruit trees, plural, at urbanforum.org or myself, Janice, I'm at fruit tree at urbanforum.org. Okay, so tonight's class, tonight's chat, we're going to be talking about fertilizing. As always, we like to bring this up. We're going to cover what, when, how in May. And then we're going to cover pomegranates. This is our theme of the year is talking about one particular tree variety as much as possible to get some nitty gritty details that maybe we've overlooked or not had enough time to talk about in some of our other classes. And so tonight we're talking pomegranates and we've invited Tom Spellman in to join us. And I'll introduce him in a little bit, uh, but I wanna get through fertilizing because that's so important and it's a key time of the year to do that. So the question we ask every month is, do I fertilize this month? In May, according to the Urban Farm Fruit Tree Nutrition Program, it is a key month to do your granular feeding. Now, granular is the chunky organic fertilizer that you're going to put in the soil, and it's a slow release, long time food source. The trees need it to stay fed. Now, we always recommend organic over inorganic because it gives a sustaining food source for your trees, and your trees um, are feeding themselves on a healthy uh, environment. It's like it's like the choice between eating healthy food or eating something that looks good, tastes good, but isn't so healthy for you. So that's why we say go for organic fertilizer. And when do you do this in May? Well, we recommend that you do this in late May on Memorial Day. That's our four days of the year that we try to teach you to do. So Memorial is late May. This is when you're gonna give your trees that boost of fertilizer that's gonna help them stick it through the summer months, especially in the lower desert. But this is what is, um, has been recommended by Greg for years, Valentine's Day, Tax Day, Memorial Day, and Labor Day. I've got more information on this later. If you, are, if you need it, you can always reach out. Now, that's when, now let's talk about what. We're gonna talk about one pound or about two and a half cups of organic fertilizer for every inch of trunk diameter, okay? So that means add just above the root, just above where the, the tree comes out of the ground, you measure across in the width how wide that tree is, and for every one inch is what you're gonna be feeding. Now, the two that we recommend of fertilizers for local is Bioflora Crumbles, longtime favorite of ours, and Tanks Supermix. They come in two different sizes, they're excellent fertilizers, and um, if you um, have a tree that's uh, needing extra fruit, extra uh, nutrients, a good vitamin to feed them right now would be azomite. And you're going to be feeding it about the same level. So about a pound per tree uh, per uh, inch of tree. I said per tree, but it actually needs to be about a pound per inch. So I'll fix that slide. Um, so how do you apply your granular feeding? 
Again, this is for all the newbies that haven't been able to take this class before, but basically you're gonna take this quantity of fertilizer and azomite if you're adding that into and divide it up for the tree into separate holes around the tree. And an easy, easy way to do this, you don't have to even move the top tree mulch that we recommend you have. Just take a little trowel or um, one of those uh, shooter spades and just dig a little hole, kind of st stick it in the ground, prop it open, throw your granules in, and then cover it back up. Don't have to disturb much. You're gonna do this in anywhere from three to seven spots around the drip line. That's the outside edge of the leaves right there in that feeding zone. And then after you put that in there, you're going to go ahead and deep water. That's important that the water is applied to help get that granular fertilizer all wet, moistened, and starting to spread into your soil. The next thing that we recommend is drench feeding. And this is you can do once a month. You do this for every single tree or bush that you have. And depending on how big your tree is, you can do one to three ounces of heart into a five gallon bucket of water. So you got your, your filling up with your hose, put your one to three ounces of heart in that, and then pour that around the basin. And you can do this right on top of the part that you just granular fertilized and then follow with the deep watering. Again, soaks it all into your soil. And that doesn't matter if you have sandy soil or clay soil, it, you're gonna do the same process here. Now, if you do have clay soil, the heart really helps make it, uh, the clay open up a little bit so that your soil can um, have better water porosity. And then foliar feeding, we do recommend you do it twice a month in May weather permitting. So if your temperatures are you know, close to 70 to 75 degrees, then you can do your foliar feeding, which is spraying liberally on the leaves. And you don't wanna do it on the flowers. Never ever spray your flowers. And you can spray on your trees. And we just had our class on foliar feeding. So if you wanna learn more about this, I would recommend you go back and go take, go watch our class on foliar feeding. Lots of great details on this. but. Don't spray the flowers. Don't spray in high heat. All right. And let's go. I went more on this one. Okay. If you have any questions on that, you can shoot me a, a question, but I really want to get into our program for the day, which is pomegranates. And I found a fun quote. Pomegranate juice has staying power. It's not a fad. Once people have tasted palm wonderful, they say they are addicted and it's a good addiction to have. I gotta tell you, Tom, I'm really excited because pomegranate juice is so yummy. I should have, you know what? Every time I do this, I get a nice quote. I usually look up who the person is, but this morning I didn't look who this up, so I don't know who it is. So let me guys, let me tell you about Tom, folks. Tom has Tom Spellen is from a uh, Dave Wilson Nursery. And he's been involved in the nursery business since 1973. Uh, that's way longer than I've ever been thinking of fruit trees. And at that time, he was a freshman in high school and he rode his skateboard to work. Since then, he's been worked for several different nurseries in California, including the Nogales Nursery, where he learned landscape design, installation, irrigation, and construction. Um, he went to the Armstrong Nurseries. Well, that's a name I remember from being in California where he worked with, worked with hybridizers, growers, and retail on the weekends. Then he went to Laverne Nursery, another one I know, which specializes in avocado and citrus. His subtropical fruits uh, and grafted ornamentals also are there. And where he was, and then he was a general manager for 20 years there. And he, currently he is the Southwestern sales manager for Dave Wilson Nursery, where we got to know him. Dave Wilson Nursery is the largest grower of fruit, nut, and shade trees in the United States of America. And boy, howdy, are we glad you're there. They grow 10,500,000 plus trees per year. I've got to go see this, Tom. And they ship worldwide. Um, over the past 20 years, Tom has done television, videos, radio, written, and concluded workshops and lectured on the concepts of backyard orchard culture. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Tom. And fruit growing in general. 
Tom's dedication and passion for quality fruit growing has taken him to dozens of states in the USA, as well as several countries around the globe to consult and lecture on fruit trees and growing fruit concepts. Thank you, Tom. Okay, I should go back over here. Hi. <laughs> hey, good afternoon, Janice. Wonderful to be with you. Thank you. You know, um, when I first started working with Greg, I was, uh, he kind of threw me into a room and, he's, and he was having this, this presentation to a group of people in Phoenix. And I think we had about 150, 200 people there maybe. And you were there and he introduced me to you and you were actually there in person. It was the first time I got to meet you. And I, I was busy as heck helping run the event in the background, but I kept going, I kept on asking people, shh, shh, pay attention, pay attention. This is good stuff. And I have really appreciated being able to have you as a resource because when we've had customers who've asked us difficult questions, I've been able to reach out to you and say, hey, Tom, this quest customer has this issue or that issue. Can you give us some feedback? And between Greg and you, I've learned a lot. So thank you. Well, it's my pleasure. And I reached out to you and I said, Tom, can I have somebody come join us for pomegranates? And you said, you can do it. So thank you. Um, can you tell us what a pomegranate is? What's, what is a pomegranate? Why, why is it different than other fruit? Well, you know, pomegranate's another category of fruit that is kind of all on its own. There really aren't any other fruit types that are exactly like a pomegranate. It's not a stone fruit. It's not a palm fruit. It's, it's a, in, in a category Botanically, it's, it's Punica granatum, and it's native to the deserts in Asia, China, the Middle East, um, the, through the Mediterranean zone. And it's one of those fruits that has been cultivated and coveted for well over 10,000 years. I mean, we don't even know how far back pomegranate cultivation actually goes, but you know, we, we do know today that it's one of the most beneficial high antioxidant value fruits that you can get. So as far as the, the quality of the juice, the, the health benefits, the nutrients, the phytonutrients, the minerals that come out of a, a pomegranate are incredible. They, they are second to none, except for a few other very obscure fruits. It's, it's the highest antioxidant value fruit that, that you can actually get. So- wow. Pomegranates are getting great acclaim from the American Medical Association as a, as a superfood. They're, uh, they're very, very diverse. And unfortunately for the, the nursery chain, for, for, the, for the home grower, there's been one variety that's dominated that market for 100 years or more. And that's the variety that they use in the pomegranate juice, Palm Wonderful, is the variety Wonderful. And I, I like it. It's a great variety. It's big. It's dark red. It has a very high antioxidant value, but it, you know, it's not necessarily the best. So about 20 years ago, uh, Ed Livo, Craig Miner, myself, a few of the other people at Dave Wilson Nursery, we were invited to go and evaluate the collection at UC Davis in, in the Wolfskill Experiment Station. Ooh. And they have about 240 varieties that um, many of which were varieties that were developed there. Um, in the 1960s, they traded with a man by the name of Dr. Gregory Levin, who managed the Gariella Research Station in Turkmenistan. And Levin was a pomegranate collector. He, he searched all through the native pomegranate regions, went into all the little towns and found the varieties that people were growing and, and coveting for, you know, for hundreds of years. So Levin had a collection of over a thousand varieties, which was amazing. And he shared about 25 of his favorite varieties with the collectors at UC Davis, and they traded some things back and forth. So we have this incredible germplasm, uh, 50 years of, of, of Levin's exploring and, and collecting and coming up with what he thought were the best varieties in the world. And quite frankly, most of them are incredible. So I feel real fortunate to have some of his varieties like Ariana and, and Parfianca and Desertini that we can offer to the fruit growing public now. Wow. I, I, I'm struck 
and appreciative of the fact that you said there are over a thousand varieties. Um, we tend to get very isolated and forget how many wonderful varieties of these different fruits there are. So thank you for that. Wow. Well, what, what we get is, you know, we get uh, this man's career. We get everything that he did over, uh, over five decades in, in collecting and evaluating and propagating and distributing these varieties. And quite frankly, uh, I, I, I don't think you could replicate what Levin was able to do. There's no way that you could go back and do that again. No, what a gift. Wow, thank you. Thank you. I, I would love to have been a fly on the wall when you guys were tasting all those or maybe just a. Well, we, we've done it several times. I've tasted every variety in that collection more than once. Oh, how yummy. How yummy. All right. So we're going to come back to that maybe. Um, let's talk about pomegranates. You know, we're going to focus a little bit on the low desert because this is the tree chat and we're, we're mostly for the Arizona desert, but we do have guests or participants that join us from elsewhere. Um, so for the people who are looking to maybe get a pomegranate and have never grown one before, let's get them some ideas. How big does a pomegranate bush or tree grow to? Well, Janice, you, you know my philosophy on backyard orchard culture. So uh -huh. first of all, let's, let's talk about what an unpruned pomegranate would do. We would consider it um, a large shrub or a small tree and naturally, most pomegranate varieties would mature out at somewhere between 10 and 15 feet. Oh, okay. Um, the, the nice thing about pomegranates and, and fruit trees in general is if we don't want a 10 to 15 foot bush, we can keep it pruned to any size or style that we want. They make a beautiful espalier. They make a beautiful uh, you know, hedge. They make a beautiful small sculptured shrub um, there are varieties that you know you could easily keep in the four five six seven foot range without any any problem of of maintenance with one or two prunings and a little bit of management every year and still get a hundred to 200 or maybe even more fruit on on that shrub wow so i so I, I, I never like to I never like to you know, talk about what a plant would do unpruned in nature. That doesn't make any difference to what we're going to do in our landscapes. We can take any plant that we choose in our landscapes, and we've done this with ornamentals for hundreds of years, maintain things that could easily get 10, 20, 30, 40 feet tall and maintain them as a small uh, hedge or, or a, a small structured uh, tree. It, it's, it's no more difficult to do with a pomegranate or a peach tree or a Meyer lemon, as it would be to do with a legastrum hedge or a hybrid tea rose. Nice. So I guess my question there, which which I was going next to, was it's not that much in difficulty to keep it at a smaller size. It's not like a super vigorous grower. It's kind of a, a regular grower like the peach trees and everything else that we offer. Very easy but, to strike, very easy to sculpture and keep in any form that works for you. So, you know, use, use a pomegranate where you want to, to use a specific form. I wanna grow it as, a, as an espalier on an eight by eight trellis and keep it only 12 inches wide. I, I wanna grow it as a, as a screen, as, as, as a hedge and, and, you know, keep, grow 10 plants in, in 40 feet and, uh, you know, keep them uh, two feet wide and, and structure them out as, as, as a hedge. There's, there's no problem doing that with a pomegranate. I love the versatility of that. And, and that gives us so many more options of what to do with it. So let's talk about um, pomegranates uh, in the ground or in a pot. Does that, do you still have that versatility, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I think you do. Now, you know, you've got to consider there are a few things that are very important to growing any type of a plant in a container. Mm -hmm. And one of the that people need to realize is use the biggest container that's manageable for you. And, and at that point, say I'm using a, um, a half whiskey barrel or a half wine barrel, that's about 35 gallons in capacity, you know, probably 30 inches wide and, and 24 inches deep. So right. that's a pretty good sized container. You fill that with soil and it's gonna be a couple hundred pounds and then add a plant and add some water and add, add a fruit set and you could easily have 
a container that's going to weigh 300 or more pounds. So that's about right. as big as I'm willing to use. So the thing you want to consider with a larger container like that is now you need to make sure that you have a balance between structure and root zone. So, you know, you look at the diameter of that pot and the depth of that pot, and then you try and structure your plant and keeping it with, within a, a managed structure so that it's no more than one and a half percent the size of the container that it's growing. in, And that gives you longevity. That allows you to grow that plant in that container for four, six, eight, 10 years and, and get, you know, a long uh, harvest period out of it, you know, a long period where you can grow it in, in that particular style in that structure. But if you let that plant get too big, then it becomes very susceptible to physical stress. It goes dry, it gets damaged by the wind, you know, the plant gets knocked over, you know, you've got a plant that's three or four or five times uh, structurally larger than the container it's in, and it's very difficult to manage that and grow it for a long period of time. So, you know, always consider that use the biggest container you can manage and you wanna keep that plant structured at no more than about one and a half times the size of the root zone you've given it to grow in. Now, for those of you who are listening, he did say plant. He was not limiting this to pomegranates. This goes for any potted tree that you sure. use, any, any, any potted, potted bush. Now, so nice. that being said, I always think you're gonna do better with that plant in the ground. It doesn't mean you can't grow it in that pot for two or three or four or five years and then transplant it out. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. maybe you pomegranate on the patio in your condominium and you know, two years down the road, you're gonna purchase a house somewhere and have some ground space to plant it out, that's fine. That's, that's perfectly acceptable and manageable to do that. So uh, I, I personally feel that any, any type of a fruit tree is gonna give you um, a better you know, management, ease of management. It's gonna give you better structure. It's gonna give you a better fruit set. It's gonna you know, do better if it has more ground space to root out it. So for, yes. Or for the for the ultimate growing experience on a pomegranate, you want to try and give it some ground space. Good. Now, my sister lives in a space where she doesn't have the ability to grow anything in the ground. So what she does is she takes them as young plants and she'll grow them for a few years and then she'll trade up to somebody who has the space and she'll start over with a new one. So that's one way to do it for those of you who have, you know, limited space. Um, just keep young ones and mature them up and find somebody that you can trade out trade it out to. And just if you're good, then maybe give you some fruit back. Janice, I do okay. that all the time. You know, I, I, I get the opportunity to try out a lot of new and experimental uh, test varieties. So uh, I will grow those in a container for two or three or four years, evaluate the fruit. If it's something I really like, I'll get, then I'm going to give it some ground space. Uh, maybe, maybe it's a variety that's too high chill for my area, or maybe it's uh, a variety that would prefer a different climate than what I have. Then I'll find somebody in, in that particular zone that would appreciate the plant. And right? Do it. Pass on the loving. Great. I love I like that you're doing that too. That's awesome. I, I would say that I got the idea, but my sister had it and you had it. And so I'm gonna give credit to both of you. Um so what are the water needs of a pomegranate? Well, the pomegranates naturally come from a desert climate. You know, they're they they grow naturally in an arid climate. So they're perfectly suited to the southwestern deserts, mm -hmm. whether it's Coachella Valley or Phoenix or down into Tucson. That that's a climate that they're very adaptable to, and and you know they'll do well with um, uh, regular irrigations. And you know you want to make sure that when you're putting an irrigation on, that you make it count. You know, no no two or three gallons in in ten minutes, and the same thing the next day. You want to give them a good thorough deep irrigation and make sure that they're making use of that water, let them go just slightly dry, not bone dry in between. And, and right. that being said, they can live, once they're established, they can live almost anywhere with a natural rainwater irrigation. But if you want a decent crop of fruit, you're gonna to have to give them regular irrigations through the spring and summer in order to bring that fruit to maturity and have a good quality uh, flavor. That makes sense. And when, how do we avoid the splitting of pomegranates that some people are experiencing? Well, there's two things that'll cause splitting. Uh, naturally, when the fruit matures in the summer, uh, August, September, October, 
uh, as the fruit matures, you'll, you'll get some natural splitting from that. The other thing that, that causes splitting is physical stress. So if you're growing under a condition where you have uh, heat spikes and you don't pre-irrigate before the heat spike, or you have uh, a, a, a windy, a desert windy condition, or you have, you know, any kind of a, of a physical stress element can cause that fruit to be either drop or begin to split. So, you know, try and eliminate physical stress as much as possible. And, you know, one of the, one of the main things in the desert is always watch your weather. All you, you know, if you listen to the six o'clock news or get the weather update on your iPhone, you can look every day down the road, five, six, seven, ten days, and you're gonna, it's gonna say, it's gonna be 80, it's gonna be 84, it's gonna be 82, and then it's gonna be 95, and then 105. So when you know you're gonna have a weather stress element, even if you have a regular irrigation pattern, you're gonna do a supplemental irrigation before that weather stress element hits. Not after, before. After, the damage is already done. So when we have our 110, 115, 120, when we have our nice jump in temperatures, we wanna increase our watering for our palm before this, what the weather hits. For any type of a fruit tree, for any type of a plant, really, in, in your environment, in the desert environment. You wanna make sure awesome. that you, you, you always are ahead of any weather stress out. Good point, good point. All right, um, so how do we know that a pomegranate is ready to harvest? You, you know, you're gonna get a, a, a good change in color. You know, you're gonna see, uh, it's gonna go from a bright color to, uh, you know, a, a much darker pigmented color and then almost get a little bit of a dullness to it. You know, okay. you're getting a little bit of a, of a bloom on it where, you know, you get that, that finished product and it, and it just looks a little different. It doesn't look quite as shiny anymore, but you've got a good deep exterior color. And exterior color is going to vary depending on variety. There are varieties that, that show just a little bit of a pink blush or, a, or a, a golden and a little red blush on the outside. And there are other varieties that will be very, very deep, dark red. So you have to understand your individual varieties. But what I always recommend is starting about the middle of August or the, or the 1st of September, look for the biggest, most beautiful piece of fruit on that tree. And, you know, when you think it's, it's at that the point where it's starting to really look good, pick one. Don't pick 25, pick one. <clears throat> Try it out. You know, if you want to let it um, <coughs> sit on the counter for a couple of days, that's fine. Pomegranates are great ornamental. They use them in fruit baskets and displays all the time. So it'll last for several days or a couple of weeks on the kitchen counter or several weeks in the refrigerator, but just try it out. Try when, when you think it starts to look good, try the biggest and, and best one on the tree. And if it's good and you like the flavor, then you can start to pick a couple at a time. But you know, what you don't want to do, <coughs> excuse me, you never want to go in and harvest a large quantity. If you, if you, if you know you're going to use two or three or four a week or five a week, then, you know, pick a couple at a time and use them and then go back and get the next biggest and most beautiful fruit on the tree all the way down to the point where by November you're you're picking the last few fruits and making use of everything as you need it but you don't you don't something like that that has a, a long shelf life you know it's going to last at least a couple of weeks on the counter or four or five or six weeks in the refrigerator but you don't really want to store it like that if you don't have to you use it a little by little as they mature on the tree. And so they mature on the tree. They don't mature any extra on the counter. No, you won't get any uh, additional ripeness. What you will get maybe a little bit of is you may, on some of the sweeter varieties, you'll get a little bit of a conversion from acid to sugar. So you may actually, uh, in, you know, you may actually detect a little sweeter flavor after it's off the tree for two or three days. Okay, that's good. Um, you know, it's funny, I'm, I wrote down some questions to ask you because I really wanted to cover all of these. And I like that what I'm asking you, I look over, I'm right in line with what I had written ahead of time. So um, let's talk for really quick about trees, the fruit trees that are young. Someone's just planted a new pomegranate this year or maybe last year. What are we going to do to help those young pomegranate trees thrive? How do we, how do we help them best to survive? 
Well, uh, number one, you know, especially I've, in our heat, I've reviewed the program that you guys have and are, are recommending to your Southwestern desert growers. And you're right on point. You know, you're, you're recommending the best management practices, you know, a good quality living soil. You're building mycorrhizal activity. You're using a good biodiverse mulch. You're uh, recommending a, a, a feeding program that follows those best management practices. So the, the program that you guys have in place is great. I, I, I love it. So what you wanna consider, if I'm gonna grow a fruit tree, I don't necessarily want fruit the first year, two years, maybe even the first three years. And, and I know this is the most difficult thing for people to do, but you wanna grow the tree for the first two to three years to build structural stability and, and development of fruiting and flowering wood so that you can get a good strong crop going forward. So if you let that little five gallon pomegranate tree set six or eight fruit the first year, you're gonna lose 40, 50, 60% of its growth potential in the first season or two. So you wanna make sure that you're keeping the fruit off of the plant for the first couple of years. And you're feeding for development at that point. So you're going you're gonna to use something that has maybe a little bit more nitrogen. Uh, and and then, you know, the nice thing about your program is you guys are using uh, good local fertilizer sources and products that, that aid, that give you the minerals and give you the NPK that they need in your climate. So, you know, everybody needs to pay attention to their climate. You, if you're getting people from all over the country that are discussing growing a pomegranate, you may have a little different fertilizer need in um, Michigan or in Georgia or in Washington state uh, or Southern California than you would in Arizona. So you wanna look, you know, look to some of the local oh, brands, wow. some of the local sources and make sure you're supplementing the nutrients that your soil is lacking. Right. So, you know, first and two to three years, grow for structure, after that, you can convert over to something that's a little lower in nitrogen, a little higher in your trace minerals and your other elements. And that way you're promoting a good, strong root system and you're promoting a good, strong flower set. If you don't get flowers, you don't get you fruit. don't get fruit. <laughs> if you're overfeeding with nitrates and you're not supplementing the other elements, especially the micronutrients, you'll have a very weak, short flower set. And your chance of getting a good fruit set if you don't have longevity in your flower set is slim. Right, right. And, and the fruits and the timing of that is important, which is why we have this, the, the cycle of feeding that we have. Um, so with the flowering season for the pomegranates, when does that show up? Pomegranates use, depending on the climate, you know, in Southern California, we start to see flowering um, sometimes uh, as, as early as the, late March. This year, everything was delayed with our weather. We had a lot of rain, we had a lot of cool, uh, a lot of overcast weather. And I didn't see, I didn't see my first flowers on pomegranates until about two weeks ago. Right. So, I, you know, the fruit's going to be a little late this year, but that's just due to the fact that we didn't have early flower development. It, it's going to vary from year to year. Some years it could be end of March, some years it could be in, you know, in April this year, it was almost uh, May before I saw the first flower. So if you have a young tree and you're not letting it fruit, you're basically going to, once the flower is done and a fruit starts to set, you're going to take those fruits off for the, for the first couple, three years. For the, first, for the first two years, for sure. And, yeah. and I know that's almost unreasonable to expect people to do that. So in your <laughs> here, if you want to leave two or three fruit on, go right ahead. In your third yes. year, you want half a dozen, go right ahead. But that first year is the most important part. Do not let that tree set fruit. Yeah, we teach roots first, then your roots shoots, first. then your fruits. Yep, absolutely. What about shade? Yeah, especially for shade for the younger trees. I'm not a big advocate. Um, you know, if you're under a real stressful condition, it's better to uh, protect uh, the bark and the structure. So if I'm in a desert climate, I would probably do my winter pruning in January, and then I would probably apply a real light solution of whitewash to the structure, especially what face the Southwest. The hottest part of that afternoon sun is where the, you know, the damage comes in. So whatever faces 
south, southwest, you're not going to get burned on the north side or the east side. It's all going to come in off that hot late afternoon summer sun. So, you know, so light, light washing is always good to protect that bark and that structure for the first couple of years until it really develops an ability to shade itself. Uh, but I'm, I'm not an advocate of, of creating a false shade around those trees. You want those trees to develop into their climate from an early age and, and adapt to the weather conditions that they're gonna have to live with for many years. Nice. So pomegranates are susceptible to sunburn and we are gonna to wanna to protect the young trunk. Um, you can do that with a whitewashing or you can even do that with like a tree wrap. You could, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think whitewash is a little easier to, uh, to be manage. effective pomegranate just because of the structure. It does not want to be a tree. It doesn't want to be a no, single tree. It's a bush. Be a shrub. Now, if right. I if I uh, if I have a, a a high stemmed apple tree and I want to protect that trunk, trunk wrap's going to work wonderful. But I think for a pomegranate, it's much easier to accomplish as a whitewash. Good point. Good point. All right. Um, so what now we've got a tree that's established in the ground for a couple, three years. What can we do to promote more fruit? And, you know, and when do we start doing this? Well, you know, again, after the third year, that's that's when you're going to start to change your philosophy on feeding. You're going to do away with uh, the higher nitrogen and you're going to start to make sure that, you know, all of your micronutrients are, are well supplied. And again, using using a local uh, blend that is developed for your climate, your area, your your uh, soil pH, your water pH. Maybe you have an element that's already well supplied in the soil, so that doesn't necessarily need to be in your fertilizer. So just a good full complement that's adaptable to your soil type and your climate. Okay, good. So keep the fertilizing going. Um, and again, appropriate protect, local organic food. Protect against physical stress. Physical stress yeah. is the destroyer of fruit. We've been teaching that. We just haven't been saying it that way. I'm going to change a little bit about how we say things to, to make that point. Protect against the stress beforehand. We have been teaching it, but I'm, I'm going to change where I say that. Um, are there any no-nos when growing pomegranates? No-nos. Well, I would say... Um... I, you know, you're not going to get good fruit quality in the shade. You can probably grow a decent plant, but you're going to, you're not going to get a good decent flower set and you're not going to get a fruit that's going to mature a very good quality under a, under a shady condition. A little bit of shade. Sure. A little morning shade, a little afternoon shade is okay, but you still want about two thirds of the day of, of good sun exposure. So uh, you also don't want to, you don't want to irrigate shallow. When you irrigate a pomegranate or a fruit tree in general, make it count. Put a good, thorough, deep irrigation on there. Have a you know nice mulch layer around that tree. Keep a check on it. You know when the moisture meter goes down somewhere below halfway before you know between moist and dry, you're going to repeat that good, thorough, deep irrigation. And it's going to change. It's going to change every month of the year. Is the plant growing? Is the plant dormant? Does the plant have a full set of fruit? Is it is it winter time and it doesn't have any foliage on it? Is it uh, is it uh, you know uh, April and it's blooming now? You know I don't want it to stress. So irrigation needs are going to change often. So the worst thing you can do is put it on a mindless timer system, a mind <laughs> that irrigates five minutes a day, three days a week. It's absolutely horrible. No. You, know, you no. want to deep irrigate and let it go slightly dry in between. I, sh I completely shut off my irrigation this year at the end of October, the last week of October. I didn't irrigate once until about three weeks ago. Wow. October or November, December, January, February, wow. March, no irrigation at all for five months. And the, the, you know, we had plenty of rain. The ground moisture was good. The mulch layer is, is, is nice and thick. Protective. We had a little heat spike about three weeks ago. And I thought, you know, it's been in the 60s and 70s, and all of a sudden it's going to be 85 or 87 or maybe even 90. I pre-irrigated everything the day before the heat spike. That's good. That's as long as good. you those 
stress elements and doing a good thorough deep irrigation, that's, that's a good growing condition. So pomegranates are really relatively easy as long as you don't stress them out and as long as you feed like you guys are recommending and, and you know, make sure you're, you're keeping up on the irrigation. The, there aren't really very many no-nos. Shade, yeah, that's a no-no. Keeping it too, too wet and too shallow, that would be a no-no. So, you know, you just want to make sure that you're, that you're e even and efficient with your, with your fertilizing, with your irrigation, and with your management practices in general. All right. I think we've covered a lot of the basics. Um, I'm going to jump over and show some of this varieties that we offer here in the, in the Valley, and I'll let you help us talk about them. Um, okay. And um, I'm gonna review some of the questions that we've got while we're doing that. Okay. So we're gonna jump over here. We're gonna start with the Ariana. So uh, Ariana is one of Dr. Gregory Levin's varieties. It's, it's a variety that he found and one that was a, a, a favorite in his collection for many years. It's very uh, dark arrow, as you can see. Uh, it's a, a bright red exterior color. It's a pretty much a completely non-detectable seed. So unlike Wonderful, where it has a seed that you can break a molar on, this is the variety that a lot of dessert chefs like to use. They put it on salads, uh, they put it on cheesecake. Uh, it's one that you know has lots of different uh, culinary uses and, and it's, it's definitely a favorite of mine. In fact, uh, I just planted one about two weeks ago. I, I didn't actually have one in my personal collection, but I, I, I you know, have always been able to access fruit in our uh, stock block. <laughs> I thought, you know, this is one that I, I have, I have some space and I think I'm going to put one in and I, I just planted an Ariana. Nice. You know, that has been the question. Um, are the pomegranates that we've got on our list, you know, which ones we normally bring in, um, are the seeds, are all the seeds okay to eat? the crunchy seeds or do people need to spit them out? Because I've had somebody explain to me there, no, you need to spit the seeds out. No, you, well, if, if it's what we call a soft seeded variety and, and uh, three of the five varieties that you guys are carrying are what we would consider soft seeded varieties, you can absolutely eat the seed. Okay, good. And so the next one is the cranberry. So cranberry is uh, one of those that has Kind of a, I would say, kind of a punchy uh, flavor. It's um, it's not quite as sweet as like Ariana or Parfianca, but it, it has what I would consider a true pomegranate flavor. I wouldn't consider it uh, soft seeded like an Ariana or a Parfianca, but it's 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 uh, on the softer side, and it you know it de it develops over a long period of time, or ripens over a long period of time. So it's one of those varieties that seems to be one of the very first that we can start to harvest and one of the last ones to be still holding fruit on the tree. So oh, we wow. start November for harvest season. I think it would probably be more like even toward the end of August, September, October, November, sometimes even holding into December. So you can probably get a good solid three months worth of harvest on cranberry. And that's a so variety that's at um, UC Davis through a breeding program that they had many years ago, probably using some of Levin's variety in their hybridization. So this is good for somebody who maybe want one a week or one every couple of weeks, somebody who wants to just take their time eating it. They'll have them for the whole time. It's gonna hold for a long period. It's gonna give you a long harvest period, longer than most. Nice. All right, the Desert Teeny. I've got this one in my yard. And you know what? I love this variety. It, it again is a soft seeded variety, very dark arrow color, uh, kind of a light to medium exterior color. But the thing that this variety has going for it is its flavor. It has almost a citrusy kind of a of a Meyer lemon, uh, even like an orangey uh, fragrance and and taste. It's delightful, uh, wonderfully flavored fruit. It's been. It's been one of my favorites for many years. Another one of uh, Levin's selections. Nice. And soft seeded, as you said, wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Now the Eversweet is kind of unique of the ones that we have. Why is that? Eversweet is um, al almost a clear uh, fruit. You can see the exterior color is, is not as dark and not as deep. 
as uh, some of the, you know, the bright varieties. Uh, Eversweet is a variety that we call non-staining. So uh, I can't tell you how many t-shirts I ruined as a kid, you know, pomegranates in the back. <laughs> My mother having to bleach them and then throw them away because you can't get that stain out. So Eversweet's yes. one for the kids. It's, it's a non-staining variety. It has a very uh, high sugar value to it, low acid, high sugar. It's a very pleasing, almost a, um, almost a, a, a punchy kind of uh, lemony, limey uh, flavor. You know, very sweet, soft seed. Uh, it, it's a very, very pleasant variety. I've always been a, a big advocate of, of Eversweet. Now, the Eversweet, since it's dark, you're going to be looking for the, the dullness to know that it's ready? Yeah, or just that you're going to get a change in the blush. You know, you can see it's going to go from almost a white to getting a little bit of a pink blush to getting a little brighter blush on, the, on that sunny side. And, you know, uh -huh. once you see almost like a two-tone blush to it, then you can start to pick and use that fruit. All right. Carpianca. Now, um, there are very few fruit varieties where I will say it's the best variety in the world. Very few. Uh, in fact, Parfianca pomegranate may be the one. It may be the only one where I'll make that claim. And, and you know, when I first started looking at, at uh, the UC Davis Wolfsville collection, um, uh, Jeff, the guy that was a manager curator of the collection said, you know, this was, this was the variety that Levin absolutely loved. And this Levin claimed that this was his favorite variety and probably the best pomegranate in the world. And I said, really? So, you know, I, I don't think I, that anybody should make that claim about a piece of fruit. And then, <laughs> then I tried it. And it is absolutely delicious. As far as flavor, it doesn't have any of the astringency that you would get out of some pomegranates. Completely soft, non-detectable seed, large piece of fruit, large arrow, beautiful bright color, interior and exterior. And you know, after trying it two or three years in a row, I thought, you know, I, I have to go along with, with Levin's evaluation of this variety, I think. I don't think there's a pomegranate that, that is going to get any better than Parfianca. Nice. So I might have to add some extras to our list. You're only going to plant one. This is the one. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to have to reevaluate what we ordered. Maybe we might have to order some more of those after this, uh, this pitch on it. Wonderful. So, so wonderful is, has been the standard of the industry for over a hundred years. It's, it's a variety that, you know, we don't really know of its, of its true origin, uh, but it's been in California since at least the 1870s or 1880s. So probably almost 150 years. Hmm. And purple is um, a, a very dark arrow. It does have a, what we would call a hard seed. So you have to be careful when you eat it. It's, it's, the, it's the standard variety that you're going to find in any retail nursery. And it's the standard variety that is commercially grown throughout California for the juice industry. So, you know, it's the one when you buy a, a bottle of Palm Wonderful, this is the variety that you're going to get. And uh, it, it, it's certainly uh, a good. It has a little more of, um, I don't really want to say astringent, but it has a little more of a, of a tang to it than some of the other varieties that are on your list. And and a lot of people prefer that that kind of flavor, that you know, true, you know, uh, sour, uh, almost astringent pomegranate flavor. And, and you, know, you, you know, I don't have to explain it to you. When you take your first drink off of a bottle of Palm Wonderful, you you know the flavor that I'm that I'm describing. It's not bad. Yes. It's not um, anything that you know I, I would consider a, a drink that I don't want. But it's just it's a little it's a little more. It's a little more, uh, you know, heady than maybe some of the other varieties would be, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a good, a heavy producer. It's a beautiful color. It's uh, certainly the standard of the industry for the, for the juice industry right now. And it's the one that, that almost every nursery that carries fruit trees will have wonderful pollen. So, and because this is the standard for the nursery, this is frequently the first pomegranate flavor 
that most people are introduced to if they're getting it in a juice or a, or a restaurant or a store or something. This might Absolutely. be this might be the the introduction to pomegranate flavor. I think that's a great way to describe it. This this is an introductory pomegranate. Yeah. So once you once you try this and once you try a couple of the other varieties, uh, you know most people will uh, will you know go for some of the other varieties. But but it has definitely has its attributes. Heavy producer, yeah. size fruit, uh, you know, always reliable. There's there's certainly nothing wrong with it. And and a lot of people have told me that that they prefer the flavor of a variety like Wonderful over some of the sweeter, uh, you know, lesser varieties. So um, I, I I can't I can't argue with that. <laughs> right. You know, and, and because it's the introduction flavor, that's the flavor that people are, you know, that's their childhood memory that may be what they prefer because that is the one that they are gonna go for. And if you are looking for a pomegranate and you do have that childhood memory that you're trying to find, the, the wonderful is probably gonna be the one that'll get you there. I, I totally agree. So let's talk about um, some questions that came through. Um, Carol apparently got a wonderful palm tree that had been planted she had got um, uh, she got it planted in 21, and she wasn't expecting any fruit. But in 22, she started getting them, and after the first week in November, she got some because they were already splitting open, and they had white seeds in them, um, they, even though she was expecting red. And she was told that they, she was picking them too soon, but they were starting to split. Do you have any ideas or suggestions on maybe what she should have been doing or how she could? Uh, uh, reaching well, maturity that she's picking them. Since it was a, a, I assume it was more of a mature plant that was transplanted from one location to another. Is that what you're saying? It was a six foot, yeah. Okay, so it, it's going to go through an, an adaption. Yes. You know, it, it needs to adapt to its new location. <clears throat> My guess is that, that the fruit that was set was from a late bloom. So because it mm -hmm. was going through that adaption period, it probably bloomed into the summer, probably bloomed in June or something. And so the fruit didn't have time to mature, but the seasons were changing and the, the daylight hours were getting shorter. So it, it still goes into a period where it's beginning to ripen on its own, even though the fruit isn't ripe, that's why you get the splitting. And that you know, could also be related to some physical stress, but you know, November's late for immature fruit. So more than likely it was from a late bloom, and you know, more than likely, it was never going to mature any better than it did. Yeah, and because let's of the transplant after, shock, <laughs> let's hope after a couple of years in the ground that it goes from this uh, gawky teenage stage to a more yeah. mature, <laughs> where it's going to start to produce some some true, uh, you know, colored and, and flavored fruit for them. Right. And, yeah, and I it, hope that helps. All all of the best management practices that we talked about are all going to be important to achieving that. Right. Um, Mickey says that she was gifted a couple of different palms from different people, and she's wondering how is a way that she can maybe figure out what they have. Um, she wrote this before we started describing them. Well, you know, you would have to um, you'd have to pay attention to the the attributes and the habits of the tree for a season. You know, when did it bloom? What a color was? Was it a single flower? Was it a double flower? When did the fruit start to mature? What's the interior color? So start to make some of those notes. And then as you get mature fruit, you want to start to, you know, take some photos of that, evaluate the flavor. And then you can, you can look at all of those characteristics and probably come close to identifying the fruit. But remember what I said, um, Levin had a thousand varieties. Uh, UC Davis has 240 we grow 21 or 22. So the chance of it probably being something that's, that's already within that 20 variety range is pretty good, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what it is. So, good you know, point. you may have something different. Right. And Mickey, you asked about when should you let your pomegranates bear fruit? I think we've already answered that. Wait at least for the third year. Okay, it doesn't matter the size of the tree, it knows the health and how established the roots are. Exactly. All right. Um, 
Sandy says last year after the birds and the squirrels picked half of our crop, she put paper bags around the rest of them. She wasn't sure if they would ripen. It took a little longer, but she got about 10 of them. Do, she, do you recommend anything better than that? Um, you know, there, and I mean, but she says she's a fan, by the way, she's watched many of your videos. If, if you know, and, and if you're, if you're close to nature, everybody's hungry. You know, you've got the bugs, you've got the rodents, you've got, uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, the birds, the critters, they all, they all want to get something to eat. So they're all going to try and take advantage of that. So, you know, try and control those conditions, uh, as best you can, a certainly a bird net. Now, if you're, if you've got a 15 foot tall pomegranate, you're not going to put a bird net over it. But if you're keeping that plant managed at six or seven or eight feet, one person can easily put a bird net over it and, and tack it down. And you only have to do that through the ripening period, through the harvest period. So you're going to have that bird net on for anywhere from two or three weeks to maybe a month and a half, and, and then you can remove it. Uh, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna put a bird net on, it's a good idea if you've got long whippy shoots coming up off the top before you put the bird net on, do a little bit of shaping up on top, and then you've got a nice, easy, rounded surface to put that bird net on. If you let that growth grow, grow through it and it gets it's on there for too long, then you'll never get the bird net off without tearing it. Tearing it or the tree. We don't recommend bird netting. Greg is a big um, anti-proponent, anti-ponent against uh, bird netting. He recommends tool, but it's still the same thing. You're trying to keep the birds off with that way. Sure, and, um, and you know what, whatever methodology is is your preferred methodology, and it, when it works, that's the way to go. Yeah, um, but what he's saying there is is you only need that covering for that short period of time and you don't need to leave it. You don't need to go on too early and you don't want to leave it on too late. Exactly. I like that. Um, Melissa says she's got a young tree. It's a one or two year, it's a year or two old and it hasn't flowered. Is that a sign of a problem or is it just literal a late bloomer? It's a teenager. It's a teenager. Do, do we want our teenagers to be reproductive at 13 or 14 or 15? No, we want no. them to mature. We want them to develop some character. We want them to, you know, learn the rights and the wrongs and then, then let them become productive. So don't ever, don't ever <laughs> consider that a one or two or three year old tree is going to be a problem because it's not producing yet. I love that analogy. Um, for those of you who do have a tree that's flowering and it's too young, go ahead and let it flower. Don't try to take the flowers off. Um, after the flowers turn to fruit on any of your fruit trees that are flowering early, let it flower and then take the fruit off because you don't want it. You don't want to confuse the pollinators and stuff out there. Absolutely. And, and enjoy the flowers. All right. All right. Um, Sharon or Sharon sorry, says, if I, if I live in a zone where we experience hot summers and cold winters, should I plan on bringing my pomegranate tree in a greenhouse to protect from cold? Uh, I don't know how cold is cold. But, you know, most pomegranate varieties uh, can take down to about 10 degrees. So you shouldn't have any, any damage unless it's going down, you know, lower than that. And there are certain varieties that uh, we have taken out of uh, collections in Utah and northern Arizona that, you know, are, are very adaptable to that climate. So uh, I, I think both Ariana and Parfianca are probably just about as, as cold hardy as they can get. And they're, they're all heat tolerant. You're not gonna find a variety that's uh, not gonna take heat extremes. So it, unless you're in a really, really cold zone, it doesn't sound like you have to move it, Sharon. Just go ahead and leave it where it is. Uh, let, let it adapt to your climate. Right. And let's work on yourself. Uh, Sandy says, can you please describe to me um, what you said that Greg likes in place of bird netting? Ah, got it. Um, that would be tool, T-U-L-L-E, -L -L -E, Sandy. Um, Greg has thought about this in different, many different classes. We talk about it during this time of year. Um, it's just tool. Um, the thing is, is that tool, if you leave it on too long, it, it can be, it, it, it can overheat your tree. Just same period as the bird netting, just leave it on during the harvest time and you get off. The thing, a reason why we like tool is because the holes are smaller. Um, it doesn't grab onto the tree as much. Yeah, it's more like um, a rope. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's much like a, 
he was on 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 a small tree like that. Yeah. All right. I think we've got most of the questions there. Uh, Megan asked me some. Pro uh, oh wait, Don has got another pomegranate question. I have a ten year old tree and several years I got fruit, but I've not had any since. I had flowers last year, but no fruit. I watered it more last year, but no fruit. Help. I'm guessing maybe she can start off with some fertilizer. Good fertilizer. Yeah. No, I mean, everything that we talked about uh, as far as best management practices, mulching, irrigation, fertilization, proper pruning, all of those things will uh, promote a, a strong flower set, long, you know, longevity of, of the flowers and give you a better uh, quality fruit set. Now, if you, you know, if you have a, if you have a weak flower set and it's only on there for a few days, uh, oftentimes pollinators don't get an opportunity to if the weather's bad, pollinators don't get an opportunity to visit those flowers. And, and if, it's, if it's a weak flower set and you have any kind of a physical stress element, especially uh, under wind conditions, you, you can lose that flower set overnight. That has happened definitely in the last two years here in our local area. We have had the flowers come out. They've been beautiful. We've had lots of pollinator activity. And then one night, of super high winds will knock off so many of those flowers. I honestly thought I wasn't getting any apricots this year because of the timing of the wind that came through. So he's right that the wind can really make a big difference. Um, so watering before the windstorm, watering before the, the heat, heat uh, jump, um, those are some really good uh, takeaways from tonight. Um, yep. All good advice. Uh, let's see. Verna said she has a four to five year old tree um, and it sets fruit in May. They get huge, but they stay white inside. The summer set tends to be smaller, but redder. Okay. So she's got, it sets different times and she can't figure out what's happening. She lives in Palm Springs. Uh, to... So is, is the, I don't understand that question. Is the fruit stay white while it's immature and then matures to a darker color? Her spring fruit, her, her May to June flowers that, that set to fruit, um, they get huge, but they stay white. The summer set of fruit, the ones in August, tend to be smaller but redder. So she's got, it looks like she's got two different fruit sets that are happening and they're different colors. That's that's a new one on me. I've never never heard of that phenomenon. So I, I really don't know. Uh, I really don't know how to diagnose something like that, other than to say, maybe what you want to do if if you're not getting a good quality fruit from the early set is maybe you want to lose the early set. Pick let that the off. Tree. Yeah, pick pick off your early flowers and and let let the summer set develop to give you the better quality fruit. But you know I. It, I don't know how long this phenomenon has been occurring. Is it was it a one one time deal, or does it happen? Has it happened every year for five or years? Or you know, if it if it's just a one shot deal, I wouldn't necessarily worry about it, but see what the tree does going forward. That's a good point, and and I really like what you said about maybe if you're having a problem where you're having a different sets of fruit and some have is doing. Um, that's like the tomatoes. The early tomatoes that are starting to come out first, the plant is too cold to get the, the calcium. If something like that is happening with the pomegranates where the early set is not getting what it needs, by taking it off, you're allowing the tree to put its energy into the later set. And so it's not wasting all of its energy on a set of fruit that's not going to give you what you're looking for. So that's an excellent idea. Verna, exactly. I hope that helps. If you don't get that, if you catch up to this later, Verna, you can always reach out to us and we'll see if we can answer that differently. Okay, folks, it is six o'clock. Um, we have had some great questions coming through here. Um, James, yes, you apply fertilizer under the mulch. Megan, absolutely do not spray the flowers um, at any time, even if you don't want fruit because you don't want to disturb the, um, the pollen for the pollinators. The bees and such are, are going to be dependent on that. So you know you do not want to preempt your fruit by spraying the flowers. That's just, it's not good. All right, so I hope we answer all the questions. Tom, you are fabulous and phenomenal. I love having you on with our thing. 
Um, really quick. Here we go. Tom, I'll never take you for pomegranate. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we've already answered our questions, upcoming local events. We have intro to worm composting coming on May 17th. You can find that in our calendar. Um, our general store is open for shipping or local pickup for all the small items. Um, if you do need the bigger bagged items, we'll have to do some scheduling on that. And our fruit trees. Oh, look, somebody sent us a heart. I didn't know you could do that. Um, fruit trees. We've opened the cart and start placing orders and secure them. I've even added a special element where I've I tried to identify which ones we have a low quantity on. So make sure you get that. Our next um, tree chat is coming June 13th. And I apologize, I don't know what the topic is, but we'll go ahead and send out an email and let you know. So folks, that is the May tree chat. Um, we are so grateful for Tom Spellman, who has been a wonderful mentor and resource for the urban farm. So much of our program has been developed because of the input we're getting from you, Tom, and um, super grateful for you. Janice, so. thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I have so much enjoyed working with you and Greg over the years. I, I, I love your program. I love everything you guys are doing for the, for the growers in the Southwest. Keep up the good work. Thank you. And for everybody who joined us tonight, thank you. We'll see you next month. And for those of you who are catching us in later episodes or on when we're not live, you can reach out to us. We're trying to be here as much as we can. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Tom. Good friends, good fruit. Good Love it. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.